Okay, everyone. So those of you that are on, um, this is a this presentation is going to be um, given by by Ryan Houston, Rebecca Major, Jimmy Tager, Paul Frisbee, and Marsha Kranz. And they were five of the 17 participants that uh, came to the Operations Proving Ground to evaluate one-minute satellite imagery um, with a variety of forecast tasks. And um, before I hand it over to them, the only other thing I'll say is this is completely um, you know, their thoughts and ideas and words and images. And, and there was really little direction given uh, by myself or Kim Runk. So uh, the, this is their perspective on, on the usefulness of the one-minute satellite imagery. Um, Kim and I are planning on setting, Kim Runk and I are planning on setting up uh, another webinar at the end of September with the complete results that has um, everybody's thoughts kind of bundled together. Um, but these are mostly central region forecasters. Um, that are going to be presenting today. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Paul Frisbee, uh, who can maybe start off the presentation. Okay, I think uh, I basically uh, introduced, gave everyone that um, introduced us. Uh, there's five presentations here. Uh, we're looking at various things. Not only are we looking at uh, severe weather from different perspectives, but we have one case on aviation and stratus and fog, and another case on fire weather and air quality as a result of uh, smoke plumes degrading air quality. So we've got a really good broad perspective here. Uh, the first presentation is, is Ryan's presentation. Uh, he's not able to attend, so Filling in for Ryan is Rebecca, and Rebecca, if you're on, you're, it's all yours. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for having me, and it's good to be here this morning. Um, yes, as, as uh, Paul mentioned, Ryan was not able to be on the call, so I'll talk uh, about his presentation and his thoughts on the benefits of using um, different images with satellite and environmental data along with uh, radar imagery. So we'll go on ahead forward. So perhaps um, many forecasters are already pretty proficient in combining environmental and model data with satellite and radar imagery. Um, but in the operations proving ground, we really focused on combining um, a lot of the high resolution imagery, um, both satellite and radar, along with um, environmental imagery to better um, and more comprehensively analyze the environment while interrogating the satellite and radar features. And I really believe that this helps to predict uh, storm strengthening and uh, weakening as these storms move into different environments. And you know, I, I believe that it's almost critical to utilize the sort of data fusion technique in the one minute era, uh, not only to um, save on real estate, you know, when you can combine uh, different fields of satellite radar environmental onto one panel, um, you can save on real estate that way. And it also should help to minimize some of the data overload concerns that I know a few folks have out there. And by bending and outlining out certain color curves, uh, I really think we can make this happen. And I'll show a few examples here soon. So next slide. So the first example we'll look at is the uh, May 10, 2014 case from the Kansas City WFO. Um, we were brief. Uh, we were given a, a brief introduction to each case, and this is one of the MCDs that we looked at prior to doing the analysis, just to kind of give you an overview of the what, what to expect environmentally. So this day we were looking at a good environment with potential for producing severe weather. You can see the warm front sort of laid up there over northwest Missouri with uh, dew points in, into the 60s pushing up towards the Kansas City area. Next slide. Uh -oh. Oh, there we go. So this is a loop of the one-minute imagery, overlay, uh, visual imagery, overlaid um, on top of the dew points, the surface dew points, as analyzed by the HRRR. We also have some uh, surface observations plotted as well. So as you can see, as this particular storm um, rolls over the warm front and moves into these 
and what the HRR analyzes is pockets of higher moisture uh, north of the warm front, um, you can see sort of the storm intensify a little bit. And one of the good things about uh, using this storm data as well is you can validate the model with the observations. So you can be confident in knowing that the model is handling the moisture field uh, fairly well. And so you can feel more confident to, to say that as the storm moves into this higher pocket of moisture, um, you can expect to see a strengthening of the storm. And as Jack here, you can see the invigoration of some of the low-level Q fields into the storm, as well as a uh, stronger overshooting top. We'll move over to the next slide, please. And similarly, um, looking at CAPE values, um, both on the left and the right panels, the background field is CAPE. It correlates well with the higher moisture. And as the storm, again, is moving into these uh, fields of moisture and instability, you can see some features, such as the Peter Cloud, um, highlighted by on the left panel, uh, the black circle. And on the right-hand panel, the, uh, a colder overseeing top. And in this white panel, you actually can see a overlay of visible and infrared imagery on top of the cape field. And this can be really useful in the sense of you can see the low-level cloud field in the visible imagery and then you know, some, some strengthening due to the overshooting top cooling. And obviously, it depends on the quality of the model, the background field. Um, but overlaying the high-resolution model and high-resolution satellite imagery, for this case, work really, really well in helping the mesoanalysis analysis and uh, warning forecaster have confidence in what this storm could potentially do. So scroll over to the next uh, slide, please. We'll look at the pairing of the one minute imagery with storm relative felicity and vorticity. And as you can see, just north of the warm front, there are pockets, um, well, pretty decent fields of higher felicity and vorticity that the storm is about to move into. And I remember sitting um, in a proving ground and looking at these fields of felicity and thinking, OK, well, you know, if we do get a storm that fires and moves into this uh, general vicinity, um, there's a higher likelihood that these storms could produce larger hail and or tornadoes. And in fact, that's sort of what happened. Uh, we'll scroll over to the next slide, please. The radar imagery. Yeah. So here's a loop of what happened. I'm looking at radar imagery. So as the storm moves into that higher area of felicity and vorticity, um, it started to exhibit uh, some rotation. And uh, initially it exhibited weak rotation, but then as it moved into the, the higher regions of felicity, it started to strengthen. And you can see it take on a uh, more characteristic supercell look. And uh, just, again, gives you better indication that the storm um, could produce larger hail or tornadoes. And again, uh, we did, I think, if you scroll over to the next slide, it will give you some information on uh, the tornado that occurred. So there's the strengthening, or this, there's the couplet with subsequent tornado reports. So again, overlying the different high resolution data sets, uh, forecasters are better able to see subtle to major changes in storm behavior um, using minimal real estate and AWIP screens and uh, could lend towards higher confidence in forecast warning decisions. All right, next slide. So we'll quickly go and look at a one of the other cases we looked at was a flash flooding severe case um, near the Las Vegas uh, CWA. And on the left panel, you can see an overlay of topography with a one-minute visible imagery. And on the right panel, a um, few points in visible imagery. And looking at both of these, you can you know, they kind of show a more favorable initiation point and higher pools of energy and moisture, similar to the previous case. And you know, it kind of points and hones the forecasters' warning and uh, other forecasters kind of hones them into areas of, of uh, initiation, more favorable areas of initiation, and also more uh, potential for bigger storm development. You can even, uh, I think in the next slide, you can even overlay, again, the visible with IR imagery as well to pinpoint sort of on the right panel. Yeah, it's on the right panel. You can see the 
visible in infrared um, overlay. You can develop, see the developing cumulus, the low-level cumulus field, um, correlated well with the strongest updraft near the highest terrain features as well as the pulling of a higher uh, moisture field. And one thing to note about this case also is that the radar was actually down during the entire event, so forecasters had to rely more on satellite imagery and other observations to make warning decisions. So, you know, having the high resolution satellite imagery helps make those warning decisions. Um, although, in our case, you know, looking at trying to create boxes, warning boxes around um, the storm, it was difficult to deal with parallax issues. Um, so sometimes, you know, forecasters, I know me in particular, my warning box is just a little off center from where the stronger wind and flash flooding occurred. So I think that'll just take some time um, and you know, practice to, as we view this imagery more in the future, which we will, um, we'll become more comfortable with what we're seeing. And so if our radar goes down at some point, we can utilize this imagery to, um, in our warning decisions, to create uh, our warning boxes and whatnot. So that's pretty much what uh, we have to share about this data fusion concept. And again, I think it's going to be very important in the future to utilize this concept uh, heavily to minimize um, data overload and sort of combine a lot of different sort of data fields to um, into our conceptual model so that we can make quicker decisions as forecast and warning meteorology um, and overall have overall confidence that's higher. So that's pretty much all I have. Uh, Rebecca, um, we do have a question. Uh, in real time, how old is the HER surface analysis compared to the satellite imagery? That's from Steve Smith. Um, in the very first case, I not 100% sure, and I, I would so. imagine I would imagine it's you know however the, whenever your surface ops come in um, compared to the one minute imagery you know it could be hourly it could be 15 minutes um, but it'll be you know all in real time. So I, I this is Chad I can uh, um, clarify that a, t a little bit. So for each one of the simulations that the forecasters completed, and there were seven, they had the, the HER um, basically for the initialization at the start of the simulation. So if uh, the Kansas City simulation, uh, you know, for example, started at you know, 1845, they would have the 18Z HER forecast throughout the rest of the simulation. And most of them were about 90 minutes long. So I think um, in the HER fields and on these, um, and it's hard to see the, um, uh, the timestamps, but I believe these are basically at most that the forecasters use one to two hour forecast out into it. So they were short term, but in real time, um, if you had these kind of displays set up, when the new HER run would come in, um, you know, that would basically, because we're time matched the satellite, they would basically update. Uh, one other thing that I could just um, uh, point out was uh, that we were we were given the 15-minute resolution her for these simulations as well. So hopefully that answers the question. Thanks, Chad. Okay, thank you. And if you have any questions, you can uh, put those in in the chat and uh, and ask questions and. We'll be glad to do that for you. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Next up, we have Jimmy Tager from San Diego. And Jimmy, you could take it away. Thanks, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Uh, in this simulation, we were analyzing the stratus and fog over the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, again, like Paul said, my name is Jimmy Tager, and I'm a general forecaster in San Diego. So a quick overview, uh, what we were to do in the sim simulation was to monitor the weather, keep an eye on the stratus for aviation impacts at San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose airports. So we were to amend the task as necessary as the stratus started to clear or if it ended up staying in the area longer, and also coordinate with the SFO tower if the ceilings ended up rising above 2,400 feet. We were given a packet that included a topogra uh, topography map of the area, the sounding at 12Z, 
uh, SFO airport information, model guidance from the NAM for each of the airports, METARs, her data, the one minute visible satellite, and the inherited TAFs. Here's a map of the SFO airport. You can see the topography around the area, and then this also has the basic flight patterns in and out of SFO. So the preferred entry into the airport is actually from the west, but if there's any stratus in the area, that does cause some problems. If anyone's ever flown to SFO, you know it can sometimes be a headache when that stratus lingers around, and especially if it's shallow. So for those who aren't too familiar with stratus along the west coast, uh, it's due to semi-permanent high pressure in the lower levels that creates an inversion, and the cold air temperatures over the ocean creates the, the stratus. And depending upon what time of year or what weather pattern is moving through, the marine layer is either deeper or shallower or sometimes completely mixed out altogether. So in this situation, uh, the SFO TAF, you can see at, at the top right, it was broken at 1,500, and this is the 12Z TAF, and then they were forecasting clearing, scattering to 2,000 feet at around 20Z. So some of the major impacts at SFO, uh, any ceilings that are below 2,500 feet is a big impact. You can see on the map you have a couple bridges, uh, the San Mateo Bridge and, and another bridge close to the airport that would impact uh, pilots as they're trying to fly in with low ceilings. And if ceilings are less than 1,000 feet, then that has even bigger impacts. So how do you know when the stratus is going to clear? Well, we look at a couple things. Uh, on the, the sounding, the 12Z sounding, there was a 10 degree C marine layer inversion. That's what it normally means as typically it's going to be slow clearing because it takes a little while for the stratus to, to mix out as the, the land starts to heat up. Next slide, please. So here's an animation of the HER boundary layer relative humidity. You can see the, the purples and the whites are simulating where the, the stratus usually is or should be. And as it loops through, you can see there's not much clearing near San Francisco KSFO throughout the day. It has a, a, indicates clearing for just a couple hours, but then has the, the stratus redeveloping. Uh, the MOS guidance that we were given indicated clearing at SFO between 18 to 21Z. And for brevity, I'm just going to focus on SFO in the simulation instead of the other two airports as well. Next slide, please. So here's the animation of the, the one-minute visible data that we were given. Uh, it's really great with this one-minute data and able to pick out the areas to where you can see the stratus is thinner, and that's usually where it clears quicker, and then also areas where it's thicker to where it's going to have a lot slower clearing. And stratus along the West Coast can definitely hard to forecast sometimes. You have areas to where it's not going to be clearing because you have stronger onshore flow, stronger surface pressure gradients. And then other areas sometimes it clears a lot quicker. So it can make task forecasting a little tricky sometimes. So what ended up happening, what we had the, the clearing forecast at 20Z and the SFO TAF. Looking at the, the visible, you can see that clearing actually occurred around 1830Z. So uh, a TAF amendment was necessary. Looking at this GIF an animation, you can see that we fused the one minute visible data with the HER boundary layer relative humidity data. So it gave us an idea on where the HER was forecasting the clearing, how it was verifying, and showed the trends that we expected to see or hope to see in the clearing of the stratus. So you can see as the animation goes through that there were some areas that cleared along with the, the the HER forecast and other areas that didn't. So the HER did some did well in some areas, but also struggled in some other areas. So we actually had the the GOES 14 rapid scan over San Diego area back in May when they were doing the two week period. And so just to throw this in there real quick, I made an animation of our regular GOES-W visible satellite imagery that we uh, receive in the office on the left-hand side, and then the one-minute data on the right-hand side. And I just want to throw this in there real quick so you could actually see what we normally receive in the office and how patchy it can be with the, in terms of clearing, and then what the one-minute data imagery look like. And, well, I'm not sure how it looks on your end. It's kind of, <laughs> it's not looping very well on my end, but once it's streaming smoothly, 
it was nice, nice clearing in some areas, and then other areas you can see it was a little more difficult. So the one minute data will definitely be useful in our office for our task forecasts in the future when it comes to figuring out those the trends of the clearing of the stratus and where it's more shallow in some areas and deeper in other areas. So in conclusion, as you can see looking at the, the data, it's uh, a lot easier to see the clearing trends in the stratus using the one minute visible satellite data. Now sometimes we have fast clearing days and other days we have slow clearing days. So on the slower clearing days, maybe the five minute visible data would be enough to come up with a better forecast. But on those fast days, the one minute data would definitely be useful in showing the trends and helping out any pilots that call the office to determine uh, when a good time would be for them to fly out. Uh, additional visible satellite data will definitely help with the, the aviation forecasts and uh, hopefully we'll come up with better tasks in the long run. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jimmy. I'm the next speaker, and my simulation is on the rim fire that occurred near Yosemite. As we go to the next slide, uh, our responsibility when given a simulation is basically coordinate and support the IMET that is on this fire. Also monitor the air quality. The, as you can see in this picture, it's putting out lots of smoke, and it's going to have impact downstream in what cities or favorite mountain areas or vacation spots are going to be impacted by the smoke. And as well, it has some aviation impacts as well, because not only does it impact visibility, who knows, there could be ceiling issues as well. Okay, next slide, please. I took a little bit different approach here. I wanted to show a difference between what we actually see in the office versus the the one minute data, the higher resolution data. And I think it's kind of clear that both of them are valuable, but the one minute data, you could see well-defined smoke plumes in that data, and you could actually could see it very clearly even when you zoom in, whereas the image on the left, uh, what we see today, it's, um, the clarity is not as good. You can still see the, the um, smoke plumes, but they're just, it's more, let's say, blurred, if I could use that word. So the one minute data with its clarity, its higher resolution, uh, also we see this information a lot quicker, is much more valuable. Next one, please. Uh, and this kind of summarizes what uh, I've already mentioned before. Uh, another thing, another trend which we could see is, is when a fire starts to blow up, uh, you could see that in real, near real time, uh, whereas, again, in a 15-minute data, or if it comes in every 30 minutes or one hour, depending on um, the resolution you choose, you may not exactly know when a fire actually starts um, blowing up. And also you're able to track the plume exactly how thick it might be as it goes downwind. One of the other questions that we were asked is, is one minute data necessary for a wildfire? Also related to that, of course, is air quality. Or is five minutes sufficient? Um, that is more or less like a rhetorical question. Uh, that's something that can be addressed um, uh, later on. And there are maybe situations when you have really big um, fires that really degrade air quality. Perhaps you do want the one minute data. But I think in many instances, my opinion was five minutes may be good enough. It's still faster than um, rapid scan and definitely much faster than receiving data in 15 minutes. Uh, this is a picture of Reno, if you could see it. There's actually mountains in the background, but it's all blurred away because of smoke. This was the conditions later on that day. Uh, again, one of our uh, requirements, uh, 
was to try to communicate with people that have to provide information to the public. That's uh, again part of the DSS theme. And of course here the visibility looks like um, is definitely five miles or under five miles. Uh, air quality index, I believe in this situation, is definitely above 101. And if we go to the next slide. Another support that we can do uh, is, again, you've seen this, is data fusion and, and overlaying uh, surface dew points and uh, wind data as well. And in this particular um, situation, the humidity is actually um, increasing on the western side of the fire. It doesn't cover the entire um, perimeter, but that could be very useful information to the uh, people who are definitely fighting the fires. Of course, that's information that, that I met would want to know if he's not able to loop the um, the um, her data. So. So this kind of gives you a perspective of the trends with the, hopefully with the, some ground-based observations nearby if it supports this trend. Again, uh, the HER would be really be helpful at least to know this um, again. So you're able to really combining all your resources here with the satellite images and the higher resolutions heard, you could get a really idea of the big picture and then provide that information to people who want to, who need to know. Uh, the last slide, please. So the big takeaways that I'd like to say is you can see this trend. One of the key points I'd like to say is if I was communicating, let's say, with the air quality folks, let's say, that are in Reno or the Tahoe Valley, uh, chances are the information I provide them was going to be the same. However, when you see these trends evolve a lot more faster, uh, my confidence is increased. And not only that, I could perhaps provide them that information much sooner than I normally would have. And that 45 minutes could, could be critical in terms of decisions that they have to make and people get that information and are able to react a lot sooner. Uh, so before the thick air arrives, let's say in the Tahoe Valley or in the Reno metro area, we, they could get the information saying, hey, this is going to be a bad day to be outdoors. Um, as it turns out, there were many outdoor sporting events that were uh, canceled that day and that evening and perhaps infected uh, for several days after the fact. Um, as with respect to aviation, um, you saw the picture of the visibility near the Reno airport. Of course, that has implications there with uh, going to MVFR and perhaps there was even local IFR conditions with the ceilings were affected or obscured. And I already gone over um, how integrating the surface dew points, overlaying that with the data, satellite information is very helpful. And that's my presentation. And up next is Marsha. We had a quick question. What okay. was the spatial resolution of the satellite imagery? I think Chad would know um, yeah, so the spatial resolution is um, is a little little greater than one kilometer currently in the GOZAR air for the visible. It'll be a half a kilometer, and the IR channels will be two kilometers. So with the current imagery that the forecasters use, um, it was the current GO, so one kilometer uh, for visible and four kilometers for IR. Any other questions? Okay, Marsha. Hi. All right, so the, the case that I'm going to be talking about was a rather a fairly large severe outbreak 
tornado event um, in the Hastings forecast area. And it occurred on Mother's Day uh, last summer. So what I'm going to be focusing on here is the role of the mesoanalyst. Uh, where I work, the Milwaukee Sullivan office, we, we kind of place an emphasis on having a mesoanalyst um, assigned during any severe event. And so during our activities at the operational proving ground, we did have a couple of cases where we had one person sign, assigned as the mesoanalyst and then two other people working as the warning forecasters. Um, so for this event, it was a late mid to late afternoon event. And we can go to the next slide. The focus for this event is on south central Nebraska. And that's where these storms produced eight confirmed tornadoes. Two were rated EF3 in Fillmore County. And uh, they some produced up to two inch hail. Um, there were very few severe wind reports. Okay, make a note to yourself, Topeka is southeast of Hastings, and then we'll go on to the next slide. All right, so the 12Z Topeka sounding on May 11th shows uh, a, quite a favorable profile for severe weather. Just keep in mind that the storms initiated that afternoon around 20Z. So in Topeka that morning, there was a veering low-level profile, a nicely curved hodograph, um, only a small cap on the sounding. Uh, you can see there were steep mid-level lapse rates that led to already high CAPE at 12Z. ML CAPE was almost 2,000 joules per kilogram. Storm motion is to the northeast. There was strong deep layer shear that's favorable for rapid storm development. Also, there was really high shear in the low levels. Um, there was plenty of moisture with precipitable water values around 1.47. Um, and I guess the only downside of the sounding might be that the LFC was fairly high. Um, over in the bottom right panel, you can see the red line is, is over the strong um, effective layer uh, tornado parameter. So pretty pretty nice sounding, I would say. All right, we can move on. All right, just to give a little background on the, the weather for that day, what was going on is we were expecting a 500 millibar lead shortwave trough to approach Nebraska and Kansas that afternoon that would help to increase the bulk shear even more. Go on. Next slide. OK, 850 millibar analysis at 12Z shows a nose of the low-level jet pointing into Nebraska and Kansas state line. And you can notice quite a bit of convergence along that warm front inferring some strong chronogenesis. There were high 850 millibar dew points right along that warm front. Um, the 850 warm front is placed slightly north of the surface warm front, but actually pretty close. And uh, in this diagram, you can kind of make out the presence of maybe some multiple boundaries from the temperature and dew point lines. Um, these are actually outflow boundaries from past overnight convection that might play a role. But the main role in this event was the, the warm front, the frontogenesis in this case. OK, we can move on. The storms initiated around 20Z. And so looking at the SPC mesoanalysis page, you can see at 19Z they have the mixed layer cape was was very high. There was a, a strong max in north central Kansas at 3,000 joules per kilogram. There was uh, the axis of high cape was right in kind of south central Nebraska. That's where the focus of the convection is in this case. 
Uh, the surface winds do show strong convergence as well. Right, a, right on the triple point of a, front, a surface frontal system, low pressure system. Next one. The 0 to 1 storm relative helicity at 19Z, right before the storm initiation, was also very strong. You can, you can see that right along the axis of high and low SRH, uh, that's where the storm um, focus is. I looked at the 0 to 3 kilometer SRH. That was even higher. It, it was very impressive. All right, next page. Now, looking at the satellite imagery, actually, um, this, this is, goes back to more data fusion. Um, this is visible satellite imagery overlaid onto the HER dew point. Um, so the observations are hard to see, the surface obs, but the warm sector temps are in the 80s, dew points are in the upper 60s. You can see that warm front lifting north with time. There is cumulus congestus going on in that high dew point area. That's the red area uh, along the surface warm frontal boundary. Now look where the, the stratus clouds are, kind of in the western half of this imagery. You can see there is some difference between what the HER model is saying and what reality is. Um, also the Surface or the there is a little bit of time lag when you're doing kind of an analysis of looking at the HER model with the satellite. Um, all right, and then we're looking for storm development right at that triple point between the dry line and the warm front and the cold front. All right, next slide, please. When we were going through the simulation at the operational proving ground, we were given um, the MCDs in real time, so to speak. So there was an MCD issued at 1749Z, almost 1 o'clock. Uh, the MCD identified those existing outflow boundaries that were in place from early morning convection and also the area of high dew points pulling up in uh, northeast Kansas. They issued a tornado watch at 1920Z, 2.20 p.m., right, and they focused it right along that warm frontal boundary. Um, this was also coincident with the area of high cape, high helicity, and strong effective bulk shear. All right, next page. Uh, moving on to uh, talking about the orphan anvil. Sorry, I got my notes mixed up here, but um, okay, so you can look at the uh, um, focus on the time of 18, almost 18 Z. I think, I think we're not seeing it in as rapid development of the animations just because we're looking at it over the over the internet, but normally you can see this bubbling up in, in really rapid time. And what I want to point out is that you can see this little anvil that develops early on in this in this loop, and you can see it. Chad, what is the time resolution on this? Uh, time resolution, this is every minute. It's probably just because we're lagging um, in the GoTo meeting. Okay, yeah. All right, sorry if you can't see this. But anyway, we are looking at uh, an, what they, a feature called an orphan anvil. And what's going on in here is uh, you can see a cloud top shoot up, and then it separates from that initial updraft as it tracks northeast with the storm motion. Um, you can see it in the one minute satellite imagery. It's a lot harder to see it in the 15 minute or even the five minute interval. That orphan anvil 
um, is indicative that the calf is breaking down. Um, it, we can, it can act as a precursor to strong thunderstorm development. So in this case, for the convective initiation, we're just we're waiting for that small calf to break. Um, and then the shear would suggest rapid thunderstorm development capable of tornadoes after this. All right, so we can move on. All right, the role of the mesoanalyst, mesoanalyst um, for this, you know, when you're the warning forecaster, you're zoomed in into the individual storms. You're looking at all tilts on the radar, and you become really storm-centric. And you, you have a hard time looking at the big picture. You, you probably shouldn't be looking at everything all at one time. So it's really helpful to have that extra forecaster sitting next to you or across the room, whatever, but being able to feed you ideas of what you might want to keep an eye on next, especially if convection is developing scattered across your entire CWA and you're zoomed into one portion of it, you can zoom out. They can help you to say, okay, now look at the storm up north, oh, look at the storm down south. Um, the mesoanalyst has time to do this kind of thing, and especially now that one minute satellite imagery is going to be introduced. Um, if you're zoomed into the radar, you might not be glancing at the one minute satellite as much or staring at it very often. Um, the mesoanalyst can help help identify some of those like growing storms. Um, they have also have the time to look at cloud top cooling algorithms, convective, initiate, convective initiation algorithms, and even prob severe if, if that's available to you at that time. We didn't have that for our case, but it, it is helpful in real time operations. All right, we can move on. All right, so this satellite imagery shows the mature thunderstorm and has visible, you can see the visible in the top left, the radar in the bottom right. Notice that explosive thunderstorm development. The one minute satellite imagery allows us to see the storms developing so rapidly, we can often identify them as strong before the radar indicates that they're strong, maybe qualitatively. Radar imagery does show these storms forming on the north side of the warm front. That means there is some elevated cape north of the surface boundary, um, but tornadoes at the surface would be more likely if that storm can intersect that surface boundary. Later in the, in the case, we'll see that that does happen. Um, there is another storm developing right behind that initial storm, and that's less um, that was also impressively strong, even though it was already going over an area that already had convection, um, just more indicative of the strong parameters that day. We can move on. This is visible satellite overlaid onto the HER model CAPE. Um, this is another data fusion product. We could overlay satellite on a lot of things, maybe significant tornado parameter, dew points, capes. Um, what we can do as a mesoanalyst is watch for trends about the storm movement and also the environment. Would the storms be expecting to increase in intensity or start decaying? Uh, now, what about the storms developing down on the bottom part of the screen along the cold front, or I'm sorry, the dry line? Um, are they are they going to be tornadic or or just severe or maybe not at all? Um, by looking at the parameters, we could still see the bulk shear is high, but there's low the low level helicity is pretty low, so tornadic development is not expected. But there should still be enough cape for some strong thunderstorms. Okay, we can move on. And then also as a mesoanalyst, we keep assessing the severe parameters. Um, the SPC mesoanalysis page can be our friend, looking at lapse data as well. Um, and for this case, 18Z, just prior to convective 
initiation could see the significant tornado parameter was very high in south central Nebraska, right where it developed. And then that area of really high STP shifted to the northeast with the environment changing um, over the next few hours. And so as mesoanalysts watching the evolution of the storms, you can help out your morning forecasters. Next page, please. This was the track of, this is all the storms produced on May 11th. And uh, next, click one more, please. Becca is going to go into more detail on these storms in south central Nebraska um, from the perspective of the warning forecaster. Okay, Becca, it's yours. Okay. Um, yes, you get to hear me once more. Um, I just want to thank, like, thank Marsha for sort of a great introduction um, to this case, looking at some of the environmental parameters and you know a broad overview of what happened with the storm. And yeah, I will go into more of sort of looking at the warning forecaster perspective and and. Um, how to integrate some of this imagery into your thinking as a warning um, meteorologist. The next slide. First and foremost, though, I want to emphasize something that I think is really important for everyone to, to realize, is that not only in the Gozar area are we going to receive data that's um, higher temporal and spatial resolution, but also the latency factor into, into AWIP is going to be significantly reduced as well. So how I did in the red box there, I see, um, I'm trying to show you guys that with the mesoscale sector, um, if you're lucky enough to get a mesoscale sector over your forecast area during an event, uh, you will be receiving that data within one minute of the satellite taking that picture. So this makes it possible to actually integrate the satellite imagery in real time decision because you can actually see what is happening currently versus what we see now um, in, in the current GOES realm, um, typically we see what already has happened. So that kind of makes it difficult right now to integrate some of the satellite imagery into our real-time decision making, but in the future it will be much easier. All right, next slide please. So we've uh, sort of talked a, a lot about these different bullet points, so I'll skip most of them. Um, these are just a few lessons learned um, from my perspective from the operational proving grounds. Um, you know, the data fusion was extremely important, and looking at different features in one-minute imagery from, um, in this case, you know, convective storms. Um, I think there is a lot that we we notice, and I think a lot that in the future we will notice um, about different storms and their characteristics that we just don't really see right now. And one thing I won't really talk about, just briefly mention here, are different looping options that could be extremely important to the uh, warning forecaster, but also the mesoscale forecaster as well, do, looping forwards and backwards through short loops. Um, that could be extremely important in integrating this one minute imagery. So um, you can read yeah, the other two bullet points there. We'll skip forward. All right, so again, I'm going to be focusing on a specific thunderstorm here, just northeast of the Hastings, Nebraska. Um, area. The storm produced multiple tornadoes. Um, we will focus on the development and partial life cycle of when the storm produced the strongest tornado, which was an EF3. And uh, we'll try to focus in on some of the few features in particular and how they can be integrated into the warning forecasters' decision making. So next slide. Unfortunately, it seems like these loops are not doing too well um, on this webinar, so perhaps it's going to be really difficult to see some of the really fine scale features develop over time. Um, this is supposed to be a long loop of the storm as it um, produces its second tornado, actually, and its strongest tornado. But some of the key points that I wanted to, um, to show you guys is looking at the overshooting top and how it recycles, um, you know, pulses up, um, broadens out, uh, collapses a little bit and then pulses back up. It actually does it in a, about three times in this long loop. Again, you really can't see it, sadly. 
Um, but that really can give the warning forecaster uh, sort of a heads up is what you can expect to see on radar, what you can anticipate to see on radar in the future. So one, one thing that I, I used in particular was the ability to quantify, um, sort of quantify the storm strength by doing a manual calculation of cloud top cooling. Now there is an algorithm, the cloud top cooling algorithm that can be used as well, but in this particular case we didn't have the algorithm at the time. So I, I was, as a warning meteorologist during this case, um, I did some manual calculations and was so able to sort of quantify um, storm strength and updraft uh, strength during the storm's life cycle. You can't really do that consistently with radar or lower resolution satellite imagery. So I think this is a really neat feature of the one minute imagery that we'll see in the future. Okay, next slide. Now we'll start to take a look at a few images um, in particular, which is good since the loop is just not doing very well in this webinar. Um, but yeah, look at a few images in particular to sort of mimic for the warning forecasters thinking as we're seeing some of these different features. Um, for each slide, I labeled the time of the satellite imagery in the top and the time of the radar imagery at the bottom. Obviously, you'll see the evolution of these features much better in the long, um, in the loop, but um, figure showing these images itself would be good to highlight different features. Okay, so we'll take what we see here, the radar imagery at 2130, sorry, 2031. And on top of that, we'll add the information given from the satellite imagery approximately two minutes later. So you can see a broad, uh, sort of broad rotation within the storm and uh, a few embedded um, stronger rotations, smaller rotations, areas of rotation, and the pulsing overshooting top. You can see the cooler cloud top um, on the upper right panel there. So this could give clues to the forecaster that the storm is probably recycling and could intensify especially knowing the environment, which Marshall gave a great overview of the environment, for knowing the environment, um, the warning forecaster could have a pretty good idea that the storm is uh, trying to intensify. Next slide. Just a, a few minutes later, you see, you still see kind of a, a smaller overshooting top um, with continued broad rotation of velocity. And in the upper left panel, you can perhaps start to see some invigorated hue in the insular region. Um, the invigorated cloud streets as the storm is approaching these cloud streets. So that could give the warning forecaster a hint that, hey, okay, the storm might be starting to do something here, um, intensify, and so to be on the lookout. Next slide. So I think uh, this will be three minutes later. You can see uh, both satellite and radar imagery at the same time. The overshooting top has sort of broadened out, sort of flattened a bit. So maybe it's gone through its recycling period. But you start to notice in the uh, bottom right panel the velocity, the inflow into the storm is starting to increase. And also, again, maybe perhaps an invigorated um, cloud streak into the inflow region of the storm. So as a warning meteorologist, I would look at some of these, you know, the previous evolution of the overshooting top and, and the cloud streak and take into account the increasing inflow into the storm and I'd be really on high alert at this point. And, you know, looking at the bottom left, the very classic hook signature, um, obviously would be leaning more towards the tornado. And um, either prior to this or currently, I would definitely go with the tornado warning. So next slide, please. Okay, so a few minutes later, we see increasing inflow into the storm itself um, with, again, a very broad um, anvil and uh, not so prominent overshooting top in the storm. Next slide. Two minutes later in the satellite imagery, so the, the radar imagery is the same, but two minutes later in the satellite imagery you can see a very uh, strong cold punch, um, very cold overshooting top. Yes, thanks Jess for rocking back and forth there. Um, it becomes very evident on satellite imagery, and you can even see the, the overshooting top punch up in uh, visual imagery as well. So seeing this as a warning forecaster, I would sit there and be like, okay, yep, this storm is definitely increasing fast and strengthening rapidly, and I should expect to see more organization of the storm as viewed on radar 
um, the next few volume scans. You know, one can theorize that this uh, punch of the overshooting top could you know, be signifying that there's stretching of vorticity going on in the storm. And so therefore, we should be starting to see a more um, organization of the updraft and, um, and uh, sorry, it would promote more rapid rotation in the updraft viewed on the um, storm relative uh, velocity. So, and in fact, the tornado touched down at 2050 UTC. So next slide, please. So we'll go a few minutes in the future and look at uh, some of these features um, as viewed on the uh, 2050 UTC satellite imagery, coupled with the uh, radar imagery, you know, the bottom part. You can really start to see converging lines of cumulus band into the updraft, um, which is an indicative of the intro feeder clouds. Um, that are, are developing there from sort of from uh, clusters of info clouds into actual organized bands into the um, updraft. As well as a very cold cloud uh, overshooting top in the IR imagery and it actually has increased in size as well. So all of these features sort of signify to warning meteorologists, hey, the storm is really starting to intensify. And as you can see in the bottom right corner, the velocity image is becoming well organized. And at this point, you know, if you don't have a warning out already, of course, you know, you probably want to get one out. But I would imagine uh, a lot of meteorologists would already have the warning out. But if you wanted to update your, your warning with an SDS, based on some of this information, looking at satellite imagery, looking at the infill feeder clouds and the much colder and larger overstream top, you can update the SDS for larger hail, or if you already have a report of a tornado, maybe stronger tornado on the ground. So those are all some features that can provide additional information for the warning process. All right, so next slide, please. Unfortunately, you probably won't see this very well, but it's supposed to be a short loop to highlight the different features um, that evolved with the storm as the couplet really tightens in response to the strengthening of the updraft. And this is just one thing, you know, you could, you could miss this on, on five minute or lower resolution satellite imagery. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. We'll go to the next slide, which is back to the longer loop of the storm. Hopefully, maybe with time, we'll be able to see it better. <laughs> but again, so I just wanted to kind of wrap this up. Pul the pulsing and recycling of the overshooting top, you can really see that on the one minute imagery. And uh, well, if you could go back to the, uh, we'll just let the loop run. But yeah, the pulsing and the recycling of the overshooting top, you can actually see that in the one-minute imagery much better than five minutes um, or lower resolution and can give the warning forecaster confidence that the storm structure on um, radar imagery will uh, likely re reflect that strengthening or organization of the storm. And as I mentioned, you know, if time permits, you can actually do quantification of storm strength by calculating the top cooling, again, to anticipate changes on radar. And the fact you can see the info clouds develop and organize better um, using one minute imagery, that can be very useful information, too. One thing I wanted to point out, um, with one minute imagery, you can actually, you know, in, in this case, we have a vastly expanding anvil. But with one minute imagery, you can see a lot more information about the inflow region um, for longer periods of time to give you, again, more information on, on what to expect um, with storm evolution. And, you know, um, similarly, if, if your storm is developing and you're approaching sunset, you'll have more data to work with with the one-minute imagery to integrate into your warning decision making. Another cool feature that you can see sometimes, especially in this case, well, you can see the loop, <laughs> is actual updraft uh, rotation of the updraft and uh, rotation of the overshooting top and anvil outflow, um, which is kind of a neat feature to see. And um, as the storm perhaps is, is nearing its demise, you can see collapsing of the overshooting top and lack of persistence in an overshooting mm -hmm. top, which can give you more confidence that the storm is weakening and you perhaps may not to may not need to issue a new warning or you can cancel the warning early, uh, etc. So a few final thoughts. Um, one minute imagery can be integrated into the warning decision process, um, can be integrated with environmental data and radar data to increase situational awareness and confidence in the warning forecast. 
process. But ultimately, again, this will uh, take some proper training and just getting used to seeing the data over and over again. But uh, I think it could be really useful in the future. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Um, good, very good, excellent presentations today. I believe we have questions, and so if anyone has the questions, uh, please, uh, if you please direct them to the people that you may have a question for. We had uh, two questions come in. Uh, I think this was during Marsha's presentation, but I'm sure that you would go with either one. Um, was tornadic storm initially dominated by positive CGs and then experienced a polarity reversal to be dominated by negative CGs? Uh, this is Marsha. I didn't see, I don't remember how the lightning worked out during that storm um, when we were doing the OPG. If anyone else can weigh in, that would be great. And also Steve Smith okay. asked about, uh, yeah. just so uh, in case you want to, about, uh, we can call up uh, rapid scan or super rapid scan. Uh, is that on a fixed schedule or can we just uh, call that up at any time to be done? So Steve, this is Chad. Um, so in the Gozar era, um, well currently in, in, in Go, you could call rapid scan. You cannot call super rapid scan though. In the Gozar era, um, they're still working out the details on how to actually call a mesoscale domain, which is uh, like a thousand by a thousand kilometer domain, which will have the the super, like super rapid scan one minute imagery. Um, I know that uh, the SSD chiefs and NESDIS are, are working on the details of that because there's only there will only be two of those domains available every day um, when we get Gozar up there, and. And you could envision uh, that uh, multiple WFOs will want those domains. So um, they're trying to go through a, a process where um, you know some things have priority other over others, such as like a mod risk or an enhanced risk may have priority over uh, you know fog in those stratus per se. But they're working on those details. So hopefully that answers that. Uh, yes, it did answer <laughs> the question. Okay, well, we're at the end of our hour, and uh, Chad or anyone else have any last-minute uh, thoughts? Nope. The only uh, other thing I want to remind uh, everyone out there that Kim and I are going to be setting up a webinar with the complete results uh, um, from all the forecasters at the end of the month, uh, so look for that down the road. We're going to open that up to all, all CONUS to or all Sue's in the Weather Service. So uh, look for that. Kim, do you have any any thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, no, I uh, I think you covered it well. I, I'll just say uh, thanks to all the forecasters. Uh, as Chad mentioned, this was their idea and their work and their conclusions. So it's really valuable for us to hear your opinions. You did a really good job of pointing out a lot of important observations. And um, just to reiterate, we'll try to nail down a specific time over the next few weeks following the uh, National Sioux meeting where we'll provide uh, sort of a formal summary of all the results uh, to uh, all the Sioux's and, and, I don't know, maybe we'll just open up to the whole Weather Service. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, from uh, Central Region Headquarters and uh, the OPG. Uh, appreciate you joining us today, and uh, have a safe Labor Day weekend. Bye-bye.